Stevenson motion is often hidden away between the frames. But there's already another engine inside these frames. Two engines on one locomotive. A curiosity and a unique piece of industrial archaeology. Of the type, only 24 locomotives were known to have ever been built. Of the six that came to New Zealand, only the first, named Monsigny, survives. She's the only Fell locomotive left in the world. Since 1984, 199 has been restored at Featherston. Over 25 years before that, she suffered a common fate and was probably saved just in time. Today, Featherston's just over an hour by train from Wellington, but up till 1955, it could take over three hours. The boring of a tunnel beneath the Rimutaka ranges was talked about long before it eventually began in 1948. And the tunnel took seven years to build. For a start, it was quite a novelty, and the wider wrapper became New Zealand's first diesel railway. These scenes of an early Fiat railcar journey to Wellington show the old line and the new deviation. Over five miles, the tunnel was a source of local pride. But as they neared the capital, some passengers may have seen the rows of displaced steam engines and wondered about the colourful era that the building of a tunnel had just brought to an end. From the beginning, Wellington settlers gazed longingly beyond the high Rimutaka ranges at the fertile Wairarapa plains. And engineers looked to Europe to copy a railway system that would get them over mountains. They found it on Mont Cenis. Opened in 1868, this 48-mile railway crossed the Alps between France and Italy. Where grades got as steep as 1 in 12, John Fell's patent centre rail was used for extra braking and adhesion. The railway ran alongside Napoleon's old road. Soon, a tunnel was bored beneath the Alps, and by 1871, the old route had become a relic. But on Mont Cenis, Fell had shown that a horizontal center rail worked in practice. And so, six Fell engines were built for New Zealand railways. Four by Avonside in 1875, and two more in 1886 by Nielsen's in Glasgow. During erection of the Scots engines, this builder's photograph shows how the inside engine drove horizontal wheels that gripped the center rail. The locomotives only weighed 39 tons, but together with the inside engine, they packed 62 tons of adhesive punch. From Kaitoki on the Wellington side of the Rimutakas, the railway route followed the Pakuratahi River to the 1900-foot tunnel at Summit. On this side of the mountains, the proposed line was conventional, but grades were steep by any standard. In the Wairarapa, seeming to avoid the inevitable, 
the route skirted the ranges finally reluctantly entering at Crosses Creek, following Horseshoe Gully and on to Summit. Here, every train bound for Wellington faced a climb of 900 feet in three miles. This would become known as the Rimataka Incline. In 1874, contracts were let for the construction of earthworks, bridges and tunnels on the 20-mile mountain section. But work got bogged down by wet weather and unstable geology, and it was nearly four years before the rails reached summit. From this point would plummet one of the most famous lines of railway in the world. The moment had come. A fell engine was lit up and laid the rails down the incline in just eight weeks. The fertile wider upper was reached and from October 1878 trains steamed between Featherston and Wellington. As railways expanded over the years, the incline and its unique workings became an integral part of the national network. But who could know that a tunnel to replace the incline wouldn't happen until well into the 20th century? And who could foretell the legends that would emerge from this remote valley on the far side of the Rimotaka Ranges? Today, the valley's a guardian of memories and echoes, and what's now a walking track was once one of the great railway curiosities of the world. Here was H204. I dropped a plug on it, and never reported her on a four-horse load up at what they call Bonnie Glen. There used to be a house up there, and they said the Joker made Scotch whiskey, but I never saw any of it. Most people's memories of the Rimotakas were of the incline itself. 
but the journey on the other side of the mountains up from Wellington was an eventful experience itself. With a mouthful of soot from the one in 35 grade up from Upper Hut, Kaitoke and its refreshment rooms were an oasis. Here you could buy thick block cake and the famous ham sandwiches and drink government tea from a fat cup. Countless were the eight-minute stops at Kaitoki while passengers and locomotives alike renewed spent forces for the final run up the Pakarotai Valley to summit. Westers or southerlies, gales have always blown through here. Today, pine trees have grown over once busy railway yards. On a sunny day, it was hard to believe that the few families who lived here at Summit generally led a bleak existence. And ever since there's been a railway, the elements have howled in the old Rimotaka tunnel. Apart from the remains of some old dumped locomotives, and a drop pit looking like a garden plot next to where a water tank once stood, there's little to show that this was once a railway halt. Summit was never a destination, and upon arrival, travellers were sternly warned to stay in their carriages. But curiosity was easily aroused as the train was made ready to descend the incline. On trains of 250 tons, two fell vans must be placed between the engine and first vehicle. The weight is now possible with the new continuous braking. Two fell vans must be placed at the rear and another in the middle. 
up to five fell engines may proceed at the head. There were few who didn't grumble about the time this all took. But a journey on the Rimutaka incline was one of those experiences you never forget. Excursion trains to the Carterton Show were always popular. At the foot of the incline, the whole operation was repeated and travellers continued their journey. For Cross Creek existed only to service the incline. Like Summit, the only way into the creek for many years was by rail. And passers-by wondered how anyone would be mad enough to want to live and work here anyway. Perhaps it was the wind that blew you over, or the winter sun that went behind the hill around two. Perhaps it was the isolation. But in an age of carbide, tallow and elbow grease, you could do time here for rubbing the brass up the wrong way. Oddly, many who left the creek often came back. Hearken to the grass upon the lawn. Listen to the mices in the pantry. Hearken to the breaking of the Ray Holmes came to the creek in 1928 and married Jessie. They returned to live in 1931 and 1944, and stayed to the end. Eileen met Bill Olson here too, and after they were married in 1941, lived at Cross Creek until the end of the war. The young wife would soon learn a bush telegraph that was better than smoke signals. When the trains were coming into the creek, they would sometimes slip because it's a gradual rise coming up into Cross Creek from Pigeon Bush. Sometimes you were listening for it because if your husband was on the train, you were listening to hear it come in and he would sometimes throw a note out to me to say, I'm going up the hill on the next trip, have a meal ready for me quick. But it was so close to the railway line that he could lean out of the cab window and just um, wrap a note around a little piece of coal and, and it would land on the front veranda. For the Olsons and their friends, these were happy years. Among these railway people was shared loyalty and respect and pride for being part of a unique institution, the nation's archetypal railway town, and a place where, almost literally, the trains ran through the middle of the town. Well, it's a bit bewildering, really, because you, it, it's very hard to distinguish just where your own home used to be. And uh, if it wasn't for that tree over there, I wouldn't be able to say, well, for certain this was it. But while it's difficult to track down all the old sites where right here there was a railway yard crammed against rows of workers' houses, there's one special place where there can be no doubt. There, hideout, ancestral hall to the six squat mountain dwarves. Temple of primal power and broken shrine to lost and ancient arts. Cross Creek Loco Depot was more than just a shed where H-class fell engines lived. Here, men kept locomotives alive by sheer naked cunning. For the Rimutaka incline was always a place of torture. And uh, the fitters often uh, worked to change an injector and would come out at, at all hours for that because it was so vital to keep the, keep the engine going. The train running depended on them. And uh, our cylinder ends got knocked out 
on the hill. I think Graham could recall one or two of those occasions where we hit the centre rail with a bit much water in the boiler. It would carry over and because water's incompressible and um, the piston would knock a cylinder end out quite readily. Well, you had a, a loyalty to the, to the work and, and to try and keep the thing running. It was, you know, you took a pride in your job and they all had to be ready at the right time and uh, you, if they wanted four up or five up, you had to have five engines in running order and you worked sometimes night and day. Our kids relied on our fitters to fix their toys when they broke down. My Joe had a lot of work too, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Even Cyril Hutchby's wooden leg I used yeah. to mend. <laughs> yeah. With Afel usually away at hut workshops under heavy overhaul, keeping the other five running was an onerous task. Yeah, well, they were a little bit like uh, Grandpa's axe. They had a few alterations and things like that. Oh, you got hot boxes and things like that, but that was through idiots uh, coming down the hill too fast. Each engine driver seemed to fall in love with his particular engine. Like Marty Boson always drove one nine, uh, yeah, one nine nine, and uh, George Walker got under one nine nine. Norm Kerry always drove two o four. Bernie Williams always drove two hundred. Roy Fields drove two o one. No, one driver in particular used to give me trouble. He, he went up the hill in quarter of an hour with a light engine and he came down in less. Well, he'd got up to about 15 miles an hour, I suppose, coming downhill or more. Probably got up to nearly 20 in the odd place. But uh, he used to say, well, I'll ring you at the summit when he left the creek. And by dear, he used to ring within quarter of an hour and he was up there. And uh, I finished up where that was on 204 with hot boxes. Had to drop the wheels out and remetal the boxes because he run the white metal in the boxes. Well, this is the sort of work we, we did here. On another occasion, I was inside the smoke box with the fire going at the other end, welding up one of the copper, copper pipes to try and keep the loco in, in steam. Oh, we, we, we did work here that uh, today no one would do, I would say. Over their lives, the Fells received many modifications and improvements, including extended cabs and extra water tanks. The two Nielsen engines had joy valve gear and were nicknamed dreadnoughts. In 1903, the class were fitted with brake pumps. But for all the changes, their controversial design and outspoken personality continued to provoke keen comment and debate. That centre engine um, that took up all the space, you might say. There wasn't much room to, for the drivers for oiling up. They had to lean over the frame, get under the water tank and, um, on the engine and lean over the frame. and. Uh, it was all machinery, you might say. Uh, structurally, over the years, the locomotive was slowly improved from the early days. I was <coughs> always of the opinion that the two dreadnoughts were um, a sounder design. They had the joy valve gear, which was simple and robust. So the, the dreadnought was a little bit more efficient than the other. There's no doubt about that. But the general, the fell, I suppose, would have one of the greatest boilers that had ever been put together with a locomotive. They, they were flying enough steam for two engines, weren't they? Well, with four cylinders exhausting up the funnel through one blast pipe, um, they were noisy because um, to start with they had full steam pressure in the cylinders as much as they would take without slipping and of course the two engines were running at different speeds the outside engine was running 
slower than the center engine. And of course you'd get a syncopated sort of beat um, and where the exhaust uh, blast would coincide. They were inconsistent, they were like women, they, they were different, they had all sorts of tantrums. We, uh, one engine, good as gold, the next day you get on some other engine, it wasn't half as good. And perhaps uh, might have had a leaky tube or something that caused her not to steam so well. And... When I came here just as a young chap and started firing on the hill, a driver said to me, listen to what the engine says, he says. Yeah. It says, damn and blast the rim of Tucker, damn and blast the rim of Tucker. Listen to it, listen to it. The last driver of a fell engine was Ray Holmes. And he's a link with we classic had, uh, technique. We had a different driver, different type of driver, they had different ideas, but as far as a fell were concerned, it was standard because if you didn't do what you had to do, we were in a little bit of trouble. Once you go along, you give it a good bubble, pull it out, you were full power then. It was exactly the same as your center engine. You put it where it's supposed to be. And she'd be rolling until she got on the hill and then give her a jerk out and that was it. And uh, once you got to settle down, well, if the weather was right, you would sit back and read the paper. You had uh, only one signal between Cross Creek and the summit. <laughs> you know, you weren't, uh, uh, no uh, level crossings or anything like that to worry about. For a time, Bill Olson was Ray's fireman on the incline. This handle, which is detachable, is used to wind the centre engine uh, grip wheels either towards the centre rail or away from it, depending whether you're preparing to go up the incline or preparing to come down. If you lost count, all was not lost, because when you got down on the pit of Cross Creek, you could wind your your guy on, as we said, to where you thought it should be, and the width of your hand between the grip wheels gauge the correct distance. The daily and nightly routine of life and work at Cross Creek was far from many people's concept of an ideal existence although most of the residents were far too busy to consider their lives humdrum. Every train that came in could cause a logistical nightmare. One load of freight from the wire wrapper behind an AB might require four fells on the incline. Breaking up and reassembling of trains was time-consuming and laborious. Each fell engine was made up into the train ahead of its allotted 65 tons. These panels of glass are safety shields in case the glass tube should burst. And it's very essential that because they quite often did burst. Uh, Starting from the yard on the level ground, the water level could not be any higher than about there. As a matter of fact, us young fellows had smoked that the length of your tobacco tin was the height of the water. When you started onto the incline, the water came right up near the top of the glass. 
and that's why the glass is so long, so that you can still see it. And so the stage was set for the assault on the hill. Another ritual battle for Summit had started. We made our preparations uh, some distance back from the tunnel, of course. Uh, the fire, the last fire that, uh, or as we called it, the last uh, um, uh, coal we put into the, into the firebox would be back perhaps uh, three or four chain from the tunnel to allow the smoke to clear. Recalled by Bill Olson, a typical trip up the hill is a horror story. Wind conditions had a lot to do with the temperature in the tunnels and the amount of discomfort. At no time were the, uh, the tunnels comfortable, but a following wind was particularly bad. And particularly if you were the last engine on the train. You didn't dare leave any bare skin exposed. The steam, uh, exhaust steam would come in under the door and in every cranny that it could. And um, they, we just suffered it out until we were through the tunnel. Of course, if the engine started to slip in the tunnel, well, the driver would have to operate, would have to close his regulator in a little bit and get the engine settled down again. But the, the fireman, there's nothing he could do. I always felt sorry for livestock. A sheep, of course, said nothing. The, the, the stock wagons were uh, J wagons um, with a, a slatted construction for sheep and pigs and the smaller animals like that and there was absolutely no protection for them and they were a double decker wagon so the particularly pigs in the top deck would scream all the way through the tunnel on the heat from the steam. You know, let your engine go, and down on the footbridge trying to get a fresh air up from any hole you could pick. 
And then after you got through, if you had cows or sheep behind you, you know, you see them bleeding at the nose for the heat in those tunnels. I came here, they gave me a rubber respirator, they called it. That's right. That you're supposed to hook on your nose. As we approached the, the top tunnel, a decision had to be made uh, by the firemen um, whether we had sufficient water in our boiler to turn over onto the level track through the tunnel into the summit yard. Because if the water was too low, there was a danger that the crown sheet at the top of the firebox would be left there and there's fusible plugs in there which are designed to melt and to save the, save the crown sheet from collapsing through getting uh, red hot. Of course, we'd get the injector on and restore the water level as quickly as we could going through the tunnel. But by this time things were very marginal, especially if it was a, a heavy train and a bad rail. Uh, the, uh, we would have maybe used nearly all our water. It was not uncommon for the injector to cut out, as we said, the water supply to the injector would fail because the tank was empty and we would go into the summit yard desperately needing water. At times of heavy traffic, conventional motive power was thrown at the hill to help out the fells, like this WE, rebuilt in 1902. And WG 480, now on the Glenbrook Vintage Railway, was used during the First World War. 480's cowcatcher was altered to clear the centre rail, and the cab was optimistically armed with steel doors against the smoke. In 1905, spare engine parts were even redesigned in Petoni workshops to produce a unique one-off 2660 Malay tank engine, despised as Pearson's dream. On the Rimutaka incline, she could actually pull more than a fell, but she steamed poorly, was impossible to fire, got too hot to work, and burnt the pants off the firemen. More successful were the wooden-framed wider upper rail cars, these were called tin hairs and augmented steam passenger services in 1936. They weren't notably faster on the incline, but cut time overall. With the convenient service, they became especially popular with women folk at Cross Creek for commuting to Featherston, Masterton and Wellington. The rail cars ran to the bitter end, joining the ghosts of the fells. And all the gangers, guards, surfacemen and locomotive crews who, during the course of their work, passed up and down the Rimutaka incline. 
I knew I did, uh, did one trip with, with, with on He 66 with uh, T. Rowdy when Ben Taken was crook and I had to do his job. Pearson's dream. What they call Pearson's yeah. dream. And, uh, and it was the hottest time ever I'd had in my life because she, she was known then to, to, she'd burn the trousers off you if you wasn't careful. Yeah. <laughs> That's why they used to be supplied with asbestos apron. And I never had, had an asbestos apron. I went and done the job and it was the hottest day's work ever I'd done in my life or the night's work. When you got in the tunnel with, it, with, it, with E66, or Pearson's Dream, as they call it, you knew you had something hot. The, the, the driver of it, he, he was commonly known to all railway men as Tiroti, and I think he was the toughest thing ever. Crockery from the Masterton and Kaitoke refreshment rooms could end up in all kinds of out-of-the-way places. In Upper Horseshoe Gully at Siberia on the incline, a culvert was built and extended over the years to channel away water and protect the railway embankment. Over a decade after the incline closed, the culvert blocked up and the earthworks collapsed in a massive washout. When they built the railway, soil for the embankment came from the excavation of Siberia Tunnel and the line ran across what can be best described as an earth dam. Somehow, if there was ever going to be any trouble on the incline, it would be found up here at Siberia. We would often be running short of water by the time we got up this far. And just around the bend here, there was a water tank for emergency water. And to stop uh, your engine right opposite the, uh, the hose on the tank was quite a work of art. And we had to do that on occasions. Sometimes we were overloaded. The traffic people would never admit it. When I came here, there was a uh, fitter in charge of the locomotive men. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it, he, uh, the engines were in a frightful, shocking condition. Of course, we couldn't take the load. We had to, we got up to what they call Siberia, and we had to come back here. If you wanted water, you'd blow your whistle. The leading engine would shut off steam, and uh, all the, the other three engines would keep the regulators open and would push the slack in the train would push up onto that leading engine and um, you'd get your water or get your some more water into your boiler, whatever the trouble was, have a blow up as we used to say. Then uh, when I wanted to get going again, the engine that had caused the stop would blow its whistle and the leading engine would open up steam and he had enough slack to get moving. And then the second engine would take up the slack behind it and that's why those fell engines were incredible little engines because uh, one moment you were stopped on the incline, next minute you were going at your normal speed. They picked up very quickly.
Gales and storms are legend in the lower Wairarapa and Rimutaka ranges, yet the unique topography of Horseshoe Gully can funnel the wind, some say, up to 140 knots. The draft uh, to generate steam on those boilers was very, very strong, and yet the downdraft coming over the bluff would cause the fire to kick back in between the beats of the engine, to kick back through the, uh, the fire hole, the fire door. They called it Siberia, I think, because it was such a barren, desolate-looking place. In 1880, as a train was being propelled up the incline, an event occurred which led to the erection of high brake winds at Siberia. When we got to Siberia, there was a sort of howl and screech. And then we felt ourselves lifted up off the line. And as we fell over the embankment, our carriage seemed suddenly to blow to atoms and we rolled down 300 feet to the bottom. One boy had a fearful scalp wound, and his elder brother had his brain scooped clear out. Luckily, all that most passengers lost from their heads were their hats as they leaned out of train windows. After the accident of 1880, mishaps on the railway were of a less serious nature. Even slips on the incline were unusual, the geology on the eastern slopes being very stable. While train shunting at the creek and summit continued to entertain travellers, the marshalling of engines and brake vans was really a deadly serious business. Perhaps it was that officials always overrated the potential danger on the incline. Whatever the reason, there was never a fatality on a descending train. In the dark of Summit Tunnel, a bell tolled when trains passed onto the incline. In each fell van there was a guard who screwed down the brakes on the center rail. The wear was so heavy on the shoes that they had to be changed after each round trip. Where a train gets out of control, the driver shall observe rule 360. That is, the driver must give three short whistle blasts in rapid succession, repeated at frequent intervals when danger is apprehended. One long hoot in 1954 pronounced that Queen Elizabeth had descended safely. The welfare of coal miners was also ensured by fell vans on the Rewanui incline on the west coast, which, like the Cantagallo railway in Brazil, used the center rail for braking up until the 1960s. By now, the Rimutaka incline had been in operation for more than 70 years.
This period was the Indian summer for the incline. credit, all the engines, fell vans, buildings, lineside equipment and track were in good heart. Certainly there was peeling paint, but this could be put down to a lack of maintenance rather than old age. Everything about it, every texture, every smell, had the patina of a mature railway, old and wise in its ways. As permanent as the Rimatakas themselves, the Fells had outlasted the term of many natural lives. All in all, they'd proved to be a remarkably successful design. And even now, for their weight, their powers remained undiminished and unsurpassed. For the thousands of passengers who'd gone this way, Cross Creek and the rituals of its railway had written itself into the folklore of the southern Wairarapa. Less well known was the astonishing fact that these solid little tank engines would go on to mass up some three million miles on a three mile line of railway. they'd outlasted all others of their generation on the main line by decades. By the mid-1950s, New Zealanders began to realise that this was really quite a special place. And railway enthusiasts ran several special excursion trains. Now the public had come to see and celebrate Cross Creek rather than pass it by. And they came to thrill at the journey. They came to take pictures because they knew that very soon the Rimutakas would fall silent forever. For the first time in 77 years, people actually stood back and watched. With a mixture of awe and sorrow, the ritual spectacle of the agony and triumph of five fell engines battling the hill.
To stand on a hill near Siberia was to witness history in action, for this was the very last place on earth to experience such sights and sounds. As it had been in the beginning, so it was in the end. The temptation from the time the first train fought its way up here in 1878 for passengers to get out and beat it to the top. Was terrible that was terrible I cried that day and everyone left and went out you know on the 29th of October 1955 the last trains two passenger excursions ran between Cross Creek and Summit By the end of January 1956, the Fell engines had gone from the Rimutakas. Later in 1956, apart from H199, the remaining Fell engines, three in their 82nd year, were towed to Silverstream and scrapped. In another time, it's conceivable that this railway might have been valued and saved as part of the nation's heritage. 1906-1907, I was an acting fireman. There were some good men here. Mm, good I men. met some fine men. There were good men. There would have to be good men, oh, don't you think? Oh, real good. There's no place for weaklings, is it? No, no, no place for weaklings. Oh, going... that's the trouble, you see. The weather is something vile. You see, we had this work here before the Manor or two was brought over. The mm. whole lot of the mm. stuff for Wallach Matter go over here, you know. Mm. I only saw one six up. Mm. Did you, Fred? Do, Steve you, Steve? do you see him any more any time with a six engine? Uh, uh, on Karanika race day used to be the biggest. Mm. I saw up. one up, one six up. Mm. Uh, it was frequent at five. Mm. Oh, the... Uh, the uh, the, uh, I was here, when I came here, there was a uh, fitter in charge. 